Hello, everybody. Welcome to your Trader Merlin Show, Wednesday edition, Hump Day, Fed Day. Fed announcement, Jerome Powell edition is magic out there today. Hope it was a good one for you. Hopefully, you're on the short side. A lot of negative stuff out there. The follow through from Microsoft and Google is pretty darn good and brought most of the stuff down, particularly tech, down 1.86 for the NASDAQ. But I'm going to start things off not by going through the markets. I want to talk about this guy right here, Jerome Powell. I, I wanted to have some fun with the graphic today, so I said, show me Jerome Powell as the pilot of an airplane coming in for a nice smooth landing. And, and you know, at some points, you kind of feel like this is what the Fed is doing with all these instruments and control panels and all kinds of crazy gadgets to help the, the plane land smoothly. So I decided to call it the Fed's soft landing, which of course, if you follow the press conference today, I said that in jest. Of course, that's their goal is to, you know, have a smooth landing. But during the press conference, he was grilled two times by separate individuals, one asking him about um, a hard landing, and then the other one coming at him saying, what about a soft landing? Can, can, you, can, can you rule out a hard landing? Uh, and of course, he was extremely evasive on all of that. But if you listen to the press conference, and I'm sure many of you did, I'm sure a few of you are gluttons for punishment like me, listen to every word of that press conference as I usually do, just because I want to see what he has to say. What sort of magic web are you trying to spin on the American people? Not a lot of changes in his rhetoric. Um, there was one piece that I, I want to read to you that um, I didn't see picked up by any agencies either from the press conference. But here's the final piece. So actually, let me go through the, the main pieces I took away from his press conference. Obviously, you know, Jerome Powell is consistently going after and saying the dual mandate, right? We're going after maximum employment and stable prices. Well, we've pointed on this program for God, a while now that we're historic lows for unemployment. So th that's like shouldn't even be a concern. And one of the reporters actually asked him, you know, what if you see a tick up, tick up in unemployment? Does that change your, your thoughts on uh, cutting rates? And he said, no, at this point, we're at historic lows. You know, I, we don't think that that's an issue at this point at all. So uh, let me, I got my little notepad over here. I apologize for not having it all memorized at this point. Um, one um, piece I thought was interesting. And by the way, I'm going to have Bill Addis on the program tomorrow. We'll talk more about this in depth, but because it's fresh and because I watched it all day, uh, I certainly want to go through my notes for today. He talked about how they've moved their policy rate well into restrictive territory. So the it feels to me like the talk track has become a little bit more aggressive towards the tune of, we've already raised enough. We're not going to raise from this point. And he also said something to that effect a little bit later on, which I'll get to. Um, of course, he cited the economy expanding 3.3% GDP growth, most recent numbers. Um, you know, we had mentioned on this program, and I think it's just basic economics, that when you have a rising rate cycle, that's going to put a crimp on the housing market. And he specifically cited a subdued housing market impacted by high rates, um, also impacted fixed income investments. So when, you know, I mentioned long time ago when we have this rising rate environment, it's going to raise the cost of capital. So fixed income or fixed investments, you know, the big infrastructure pieces, seeing less of that, according to Jerome Powell. And of course, that is due to borrowing costs. If I could borrow money a year ago at, let's say, 2%, and now it's going to cost me, you know, four and a half, I've doubled my cost of doing business, essentially, just on those business investments. So he noted the rising rate environment hurting those two market segments, which you and I know, but it was just here to, good to hear the validation. Um, Let's see, what was the other part here that was pretty good? Um, I always like when he references how much, what they've done to kind of like give himself a pat on the back. You know, they've raised five and a quarter uh, percentage points in the last two years, and they've also sold $1.3 trillion worth of securities. Now, he mentioned it three times during the press conference that they're going to continue to aggressively unwind their balance sheet, which, remember, when they're unwinding their balance sheet, they're selling those assets. So you look at the supply and demand equation, you have them out there selling more and more of these products that could have an impact on their prices or rates that those products may yield. So here's the big final takeaway. I'll leave it at that. I don't want to get too in-depth on this one. Um, I want to save a lot of it for tomorrow with Bill Addis, which will be one of my favorites. It's a lengthy one. Hopefully I wrote it down legibly for myself. He said, we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak. I like that one. Uh, if you're bullish on the markets, you've got to love that one. And, and you're surprised that it kind of sold off today because essentially what he said there is, as a team, we believe that we're not going to go above five and a quarter. This is it. We peaked out. Now, of course, something could happen. But so we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. And that if the economy expands broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraints at some point this year. Now, this is no mystery. We've known that. We've looked at that FOMC table several times, the, the Fed Funds Futures 
just to kind of gauge what they're doing. Market fully anticipates this, but this is really the kind of, at least for me, the first time he's really been factual and said, yep, we're going to cut rates this year. Now, the the hypothesis was that, oh, we might see some. That was a pretty definitive one. And unfortunately, this rate uh, sheet I have here was adjusted as of 3 o'clock this morning, Central Time. So this does not include the current um, assessment. But, you know, going into, let's see, uh, this, is, this is for the March meeting. Notice it's already started to shift. For the March meeting, you've got about a 34% chance of getting a rate cut. Um, Jerome Powell specifically said, based off of the way things are going now, March may be a bit too soon for that. Um, and he said, we'll continue to hold this. So I, I don't, at this point, based off the data, don't think you're going to see March either. What you'll probably see is the one after that, which is going to be May. Conveniently, that ties in perfectly with the halving of Bitcoin. All right. Um, and right now, it looks to be about a 92.4% chance that they're going to have a rate cut by that May 1st meeting. Now, the good news here is it's 62% chance of a 25 basis point cut, but a 31% chance of a 50 basis point cut. I am in the camp of the statistical average here, which is we'll probably see 25 basis point cut on May 1st, barring no other crazy data, right? We start to see some other bad data that could have a big impact on things and, and move markets further south. But uh, at this point, I think it all looks pretty decent. Now, there is one other thing to pay attention to on this, and that is uh, coming up in um, February, February 9th. So not this Friday, but next Friday, the calculations for CPI are going to be adjusted. Now, this is like you know moving the goalposts on your football team. You know right where you're supposed to be, but they'll just kind of move it around to what fits their agenda. I don't like this at all, and I'll do my best to find out exactly what has been augmented and changed in that CPI reading. When you adjust consumer price index, it would not surprise me at all to have them tweak things so now they can say, hey, we've met our 2% agenda. It would be surprising, I think you'd agree with this, it'd be a bit surprising to see them adjust it upward and make it more difficult, showing higher inflation for the Fed, right? They want to make themselves look great. Let's do a minor tweak to CPI numbers to make that inflation number drop. Now, that said, what that means to me anyway, and you guys let me know, I love full uh, interaction here, but if you look at the prospects of them changing the components of CPI, adjusting consumer price index components, and I can't see them making it more restrictive. I think they'll make it more of an easing thing. So removing something that has high inflation and is impacting it, to me, that says the inflation numbers are going to be reading lower over the next you know, year or so. Therefore, that would lead the Fed to do more rate cuts, ultimately leading to more bullish markets. Think I'm wrong? If you do, let me know. What do you think? Um, do you think that the markets will be bullish off that or not? My process of you know dominoes, or the, what do they call it, the Rube Goldberg puzzles, tells me that that domino effect is going to lead to a more bullish market cycle if they do remove the inflationary components of CPA or downplay those. But apparently I've got no no comments from you guys yet. Uh, let's see. Big Ab says, good time to have Q puts some early. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, I don't have as much as I wanted. I, I would have liked to have added more to that position, but... With these announcements this week, with the Fed, with all of a sudden, you know, five of the Magnificent Seven reporting, uh, I chose not to load up on that position. But yeah, that position's done very well. Um, and we'll see if that continues on. we got a couple more days. This is right. But Powell said he wanted to see more than just a tap at 2%. Exactly. He wanted to see it settling underneath that. And there was an interesting question during the press conference that actually showed that the most recent core PCE price index numbers were actually running around 1.6%. He goes, you know, what do you... You know, are you concerned that you may actually overshoot that and get underneath it? And Jerome Powell like, no, not really. Didn't Powell say he wanted inflation at 2%? Yes, exactly. That's what he did say. Um, and it's actually, if you go back, I think the past couple readings, it's actually underneath that at this point. Um, but yeah, who knows? Who knows? It's all one giant chess game. What I do like is the way the markets reacted today. Let me go bring up some charts for you here. Let's go to our S&P 500 and I'll run through our market. Liz says, I wish I had a better understanding, so I really cannot make an educated comment, but I do agree with it becomes a bullish market. No, you are, Lisa, don't downplay yourself. You have a pretty good understanding of how the, all this stuff works, you know? It's just, it's just how do you, you, the way I approach it is, 
it's just this massive sequence of Excel if then statements, right? If this cell is occupied, then color this cell green. If that cell's not occupied, then color that cell red. I mean, to me, that's like, you know, binary type stuff. So if you look at, let's change inflation numbers and make those inflation numbers look better for us. Okay, great. If that happens, then what happens? If the inflation numbers look better, then the Fed will be more likely to but cut rates, stimulate the economy because inflation is under control. I can now get it back on track and hopefully spur economic growth. That's that if then statement. And you just kind of keep doing this for every little component. Pretty soon you're left with this tree of possibilities. Of course, anything can happen, but you and you guys, we've got a pretty astute group here. Y'all know. All right, let me look at uh, just the S&P today and then I'll go one by one and look at a couple other pieces going forward. Exactly, Chio, but they keep adjusting the numbers. It's just, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, and I've mentioned this before, but I interviewed a guy that worked for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and uh, it was just it's just awful how they modify these things. So, you know why I always call this the popcorn trade of the day, right? And, and any FOMC announcement, popcorn trade of the day. It's just because stuff moves so rapidly. And I'm going to put three uh, two goalposts on here. The first one's the 11 o'clock, right as that announcement came out from Jerome Powell. And notice the moment it came out that we're going to keep rates right where they're at, markets started to fall pretty quickly. And then... You get to his press conference at 11.30 and all of a sudden it ticks up and starts to rip to the upside. And then we came screaming back down midway through his press conference. So I'm not sure what triggered the, the big sell-off there. I'll be honest, in looking at the press conference, it actually felt rather optimistic, which is why I have this humorous graphic, the Fed soft landing, because at least from the data that he was talking about, it really felt like things were starting to look better. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not, uh, I'm not in Jerome Powell's, I'm not for or against him at all. You know, as a trader, I, I can't, I don't care about that stuff. I'm really just looking at the numbers and saying, okay, how does this pan out? If we do get lower inflation, if we do keep um, our unemployment number where it's at, and we do see jobs growth continue, it's hard to argue that we're not having a soft landing. Um, what, what data do we want to look at that would contradict that and make it a rough landing? You know, it's hard to believe we could have one based off what happened, but, you know, I don't believe we're out of the woods yet. It, it feels like the plane is coming down and starting to land, but I don't know if we quite see the runway yet. You know, and maybe it's just a rock runway. I don't know. Um, but the data so far is looking good. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say a lot of it is manipulated, which I totally agree with you, but I have no other data to go off of, right? I just have what I'm presented to from these different agencies, which, of course, brings me back to trading is a rigged game. Marcus Jerome looks like he's a pilot. Yep, that's what it was. I, I wanted him as a pilot having the soft landing. That was my whole, my AI uh, choice there was, show me Jerome Powell as a pilot landing a plane. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, all right, what do we got? Oh, Steve, great, exactly. That, that was the reference I wanted, Airplane. One of the best comedy movies out there. Don't call me Shirley. <clears throat> Uh, what else do we got? Uh, well, we could change the definition of a soft landing, I suppose. Correct. You know, it, and I love the the comment that just came through there, which is, you know, now, uh, you know, now a touchdown in football is gonna be ten points. You're right, Sly. It's like, oh, next season. Then all, if you do that, if you change the touchdown from six points to ten points, what happens? Is every historical football player who scored a number of points is now irrelevant because every score now is worth so much more? They'll get passed, and it just yeah, it's annoying. Uh, anyway, let's see. What do I got here? Let me run through some of these comments, and I'll run through. I want to go through our uh, what happened for the month of January. Uh, any chance they will restate the historic result under the new measure? Uh, somehow, I suspect not. Restate the hist. Oh, you mean? Are you talking about going back and changing like CPI in its true form? Um, I believe you can go to Shadow Stats. Shadow Stats did a, a really good job at like tracking what the actual real, yeah, what the real numbers are. So if you go to Shadow Stats, uh, there there used to be all kinds of where it would tell you the actual true CPI and, and all the different. Um, but I don't know if this was. It used to just be a page full of statistics, so I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking at now. Uh, but Shadow Stats used to have that. Used to have. Um, the real CPI and the real numbers that haven't been modified or augmented. Just Jerome, Jerome Powell speak jive. Uh, I did get a question today asking if those press conferences are live or not, which is a good question. Uh, that was from Liz. Yes, it is live. 
And, and the reason why is this. It would be somewhat constituted as insider trading if the FOMC did not release that statement at the same time to everybody. They would be viewed as insider trading, right? Because you're getting access to information which can move the markets before anybody else. So they have to do it at the same time to everybody. So is there maybe a, if you're, if you're there, great. If you're watching it live, there might be a streaming delay of 30 seconds. I know that on this one, there is a delay as well. Um, and, and that's a choice that I chose. If I do normal streaming on YouTube, there's a 30 second delay built in. I think that's just software. Um, when I was doing live radio, there was a 15 second delay. And that was in case I had a live caller and they dropped the F-bomb or something, I could censor that out because that was a live show. Um, but yeah, this, the streams are delayed uh, maybe for errors in their speech, but they're all gonna be done live. And you know we may get them 30, maybe 60 seconds later due to censorship or, or uh, the network that they're streaming on. Um, I know, I know, Jab, like, you speak Jab, though. God, now you're going to make me go watch that movie again tonight. That was such a classic. Uh, what do we got here? Yes, I think it was sad we might not have a March rate cut is when the markets, oh, that could be less. I wasn't paying attention to the exact time that happened, but that would make sense because the market is expecting a March rate cut. And if we don't get that, it pushes it out, but... Uh, all in all, I think the market should feel comfortable with this right now. This is pretty good. Let's see. Tom says, uh, the markets were manipulated way up, so I was expecting a, a down move at the same time. Uh, algo programs, see how we like to lose money, so they shake it up and down a bit before. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a lot of action out there. I just, you know, I mentioned this the other day. It felt like the market had gone up too far too fast, tech really just surging, and all of a sudden now we get all the tech companies reporting, you know, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. So if the markets had been selling off aggressively going into these tech announcements, I may actually be looking at buying calls, um, buy the rumors, sell the news that they're going to disappoint earnings, and then they beat their earnings, etc. So, um, what's happened to you? 1080p? Is it not streaming 1080p right now, Ben? It should be streaming 1080p. Should be streaming 1080p. Uh, NJ said, "Add more shorts on McDonald's at 295." Uh, I think because now a Big Mac combo. Car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous how much that stuff costs. All right, let's go through our uh, top seven, at least for the month of January, top eight for the month of January. Um, I'm curious, you guys type in a chat, what do you think was the worst? Give me your worst and first. So type in worst is this one, and then the, the best was this. What's the worst performer out of our top eight for the month of January, and what do you think is the best performer? I'll give you a second to type those in before I, I move forward here because there's a, a little bit of a delay. I'll start at the bottom. Uh, surprisingly, for the month of January, there were only two out of our eight that we watched that were negative. That first one, Russell 2000, down 4.46%. It was definitely the ugliest of the bunch for the month, and today did not help. It was down 2.49%. Here is your Russell 2000 for the month. Uh, actually, not for the month, but just the chart of it. And not looking good. You know, it felt like it was starting to rally back up and maybe catch these other indexes. Now leading the way down today, down 2.49% when so the other indexes were down, you know, 1.5%, maybe 2. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, Dave, NG is one of the, not one of the top eight that I cover. So I see a lot of people say NASDAQ. Worst is gold. Best is ES. Okay. I see best NASDAQ. Worst natural gas. Yeah, natural gas. But natural gas isn't these top, top eight that we look at. So you know now the worst is Russell out of R8. Number seven on this was gold, GC. So that gold down slightly, even though today you had a, um, a nice move to the upside, right? The last couple of days has been a great move up for gold. However, for the month of January, you are just ever so slightly down 0.77%. So um, nothing dramatic there. And honestly, that's not bad considering we only have two down markets. Four, two of our seven are down for the month of January. Now we get to the positive territory stuff. Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin, not the best because it, it had those pretty aggressive down moves when the Bitcoin futures ETF or the spot ETF came into existence. We had that really big move of what, 23% slide, rallied up aggressively for the past few days. Today, down 2.45%, closing at 42,815. That made it number five on our list. Moving on to number four, I think, or four. Yep, S&P 500, 1.03. So we got some some bad guesses out there today. Um, 
Let me get that line, vertical line off of there. That ES, this is a pretty ugly picture. I was really kind of thinking we would stall around that 48.89. Uh, we went right through it. And if, you know, we'd have to break this apart into some smaller time frames. I'll go hourly, you know, just looking for where's that next spot. And I don't see any great ones. Your next real kind of significant one is at 48.27 and followed by you know right around 48.16. So there still is a lot of downside move in this S&P, which of course being short the NASDAQ, I'm okay with that. Keeps selling off, but not looking that great right now. Next, oh, sorry, I didn't you know, I wasn't showing you the chart. There's our chart of the S&P and I wanted to show you the uh, hourly. There you go. So those are the levels down there, you know, about 48.30. And then you have this other one, which has already been touched right around 48.16. So there we go. And got your charts for you. Back to top three. Ten year bond. Um, this was you kind of surprising for me. And, and the reason I say, um, is it frozen? No, you're not frozen. You're good. <clears throat> yeah, I had no chart. I was uh, I was I was sidetracked, John. It was my fault. My fault. Um, let's go look at the tenure. So I was, you know, looking at the the S and P and the Nasdaq, which did pretty well for the month. If you look at the tenure, right here's your your one hour. Let's go back to the daily. This is certainly a big factor in it. Now for the month we did have it up, but the last three days have been really aggressive sell off. We've come back down to the very bottom end of that demand zone, at least the I see as a demand zone. Everybody sees things differently, and that's gonna be right here. We're like right in it right now on that ten year. Uh, if that breaks, I mean, what that really signifies is this yield is gonna be getting lower than that and challenging these lows that we saw back in December of 2024. Oh, sorry. I keep doing this and I'm not showing the charts. Um, now we have the charts. So you notice that I mentioned a couple days ago when we were here that it felt like we got a nice short-term uptrend headed towards that upper yellow box and that trend line. That's what we it felt like. And I was um, feeling good about that. All of a sudden, we broke a little bit. I was like, no worries. If we hold right there at 4.07, shouldn't be a big deal. Now, all of a sudden, we've broken that. And today's acceleration of the downside is pretty aggressive. And, you know, there's really one stopping point, which is these levels here at 3.9, which you're currently at. After that, you're looking at these new next lows, call it 3.7879. <clears throat> yes, that demand zone uh, was already tested. So not, not feeling great about this position, or not position, but the, the direction of the 10-year Again, this sell-off should accelerate markets to the upside and show big gains. But today, we actually saw negative on the 10-year. You saw negative on the market index. So it was a lot of negative stuff in there. Um, not, not very good for that 10-year. All right, I will do my best to, when I click on it and tell you what the next one is, to show it as opposed to not. All right, <clears throat> NASDAQ was not your best performer. 1.34% is where the NASDAQ 100 finished the month of January. I will bring it up. Now you have the charts right as I talk about them. But its picture looks better than all of them. I mean, NASDAQ obviously looks fantastic. The main drag you have down today is because of Google and Microsoft. While I, uh, I show you this one, let me real quickly bring up uh, Microsoft. I mean, that was a pretty big down day, 2.69%. And also coming down another quarter of a percent in after hour session. That was Microsoft, Google, the real ugly day, down 7.35%. Ouch. Kind of surprised NASDAQ didn't tank more than the 1.97% that it did. Uh, that's that's not good at all. But anyway, big down day here for Google. Um, you know, typically what you get on things like this is bargain hunters and people coming and buying value. Oh, well, was it 155 yet today? Or yesterday, now it's 141. Buy some. Uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to play that one. I don't know if I'll play that, uh, play that one. Uh, let me get to the end here and I'll go over the... Um, 720. Yeah, I noticed that on most Ben. So I've actually been going out to YouTube and checking this because I've been looking at my stream to see if I get 1080. I'm not. It's not showing up on mine as uh, on my menu at the bottom on the YouTube video as having 1080. I'm streaming it out at 1080. So you should be getting a pretty good resolution picture. All those uh, age wrinkles on my forehead and, and, and blemishes. You should see all those in, in HD. Um, I'll I'll work on it. Yeah, so good to hear that you guys have the same issue. So maybe it's something that I need to do a change setting in Google when I or YouTube when I stream it. But for my software out, I'm streaming at uh, I'm streaming at uh, 1080. But I'll get it fixed. I, I've been wanting to. 
figure this stuff out and get it better for you. All right, let's go to the top two. NASDAQ was number three. Number two, dollar index. The Dixie, 2.1% for the dollar this month. That is not very good for the market. However, the past two and a half weeks have been boring as hell. That chart looks awful. I'll put a vertical line just so you can see where January began. Started off real strong, looked great. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I look good at 480. <laughs> I look nice and blurry. I look better when I get blurry. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we really did great on that dollar index, but flatline ever since the 17th of January. So it's been half the month of just sideways action. Typically, uh, you guys, if you if you want, not take my word for it, but if you read the, the books by um, Thomas Bukowski, I think it's Thomas Bukowski. Is it Charles Bukowski or Thomas? I don't know. It's one of the Bukowskis. One of them is an author and one of them is a technical analyst. But anyway, he, um, he talks about the statistical probability of trends. And since you have this short-term trend on the dollar index, which started back in December 28th, you've got higher highs, higher lows. Um, when you have this hesitation, it usually breaks out in the direction of that previous trend. So hopefully... Um, not hopefully, but it looks like this will break to the upside just like it did uh, back here during that consolidation from uh, January 4th through 11th and then ripped up for three days and then went sideways again. So hopefully we'll see that happen here again soon. And finally, your number one, drum roll please, oil. Yeah, 5.78% on oil to the upside. Hmm, those inflation numbers looking real good, but we saw for the month of January, oil up 5.78%. We might see the next month's CPI numbers not look so good, unless, of course, they change it for that February 8th reading. Oh, wait, they are changing it. Here is your crude oil chart, down 2.5% today. So even with that 2.5% slide showing a pretty good month. Now, let me um, bring up the full month there. There you go. That's your first day of January. Uh, all was looking pretty good for crude oil up until about three days ago when things just uh, peaked out and, and sold off. That's probably right as I was saying by the pullback here at 76.18 and now we are bound below that. So that is your your top eight marketplaces out there. Um, not a bad not a bad month. you know all in all, you look at this, they say as goes January, so goes the rest of the year. The only one that really um, was an issue was the Russell. Other than that, everything's showing green. Pepe said, how was your trading in January? Mine was good. Not great. Had three day red days uh, in January, but one red day was twice my daily loss. Ooh, that's not good. Um, I had a pretty good January. Um, most of my trades were good. I had a, a, a one trade on boil that went against me all, all together. I had a pretty good, fairly consistent one. So off to a good start for myself, but uh, still got 11 months to go until I actually get those end of the year numbers. But... I typically don't look at it month on month as far as being a result. I, I love the, the statement that's made by a lot of my peers that say, uh, you know, you hear Corey Lane talk about it and Larry Jacobson talk about it. It's like, you know, one month doesn't make you a great trader. It's a summation of, of all your months of trading and, and averaging things out over time. So, yeah, we'll see what happens by the end of the year. So let's just real quickly run through our today activity. I'm going to sort these now or resort these. Uh, we already mentioned crude oil was your worst performer on the day down 2.53. You notice we got three down below 2% on the day. Woo, almost four. Goodness, Russell 2000, you know, your next logical target. I, I still, when we came down towards this area, right around 1900, that's where I was expecting it to turn. I expected it to go deeper into the zone. Still, I'm waiting for it to get there. So I think a pullback into that 1900 spot is, is not out of the question for the Russell. Here's your Bitcoin chart down 2.45%. All in all, not that big of a deal. We actually did a pretty big discussion for anybody who is interested in um, you know, more Bitcoin stuff. I did a, a session in the XLT general session today for an hour and a half kind of on Bitcoin to having uh, and a variety of other questions related to crypto and digital assets. So for you OTA people, check that one out. Uh, technically, uh, I don't I don't see anything here to talk about. What, what do you want me to say? Uh, we had a down day today, big deal. I don't know which way this thing's going to go. It, it, I do think you've bottomed out at 3,800 or 38,000. I think you'll start to see this move up. Um, what is interesting is looking at the the numbers of the Bitcoin ETFs. So I broke apart for the XLT session today. I broke apart 12 different ETFs, including two futures ETFs. And if you break them apart by volume, which is your liquidity, you break it apart by uh, the fee structure, what you'll probably see is out of those 12, within the next year, maybe four exist. So there's going to be a bunch of those that fall by the wayside and go the way of the dodo um, here shortly. So 
keep your eye on uh, on some of those Bitcoin ETFs. All in all, what that will do is we'll just push more money into the bigger funds, which will probably be things like Fidelity or the BlackRock yeah, ETF for spot crypto, spot bought Bitcoin. All right, I was on the NASDAQ, which had a big you know, kick in the teeth today because of what happened with Google and Microsoft. But tomorrow, an even bigger day, guys. Honestly, it's, it's arguable that it's a bigger day. I think that the Thursday earnings is bigger than today's. Yes, Microsoft is the most influential on um, the NASDAQ, 100. Uh, but it jockeys back and forth with Apple. So you had Google, which is like you know five on the list. But when you look at Thursday, tomorrow night's earnings, you've got Amazon, you've got Apple, which is number one on a bunch of indexes, and in a billion different ETFs and funds. And then you also have Meta reporting. So that's going to be a pretty... Um, thank you, Chio. Smash that like button. I never do gratuitous self-promotion. Uh, you know, one thing I learned about a lot of these... The guys that have millions of followers, as they're always on every show, they'll say it three or four times. Guys, smash the like button. Or they'll start their show with, if you like our content, hit the subscribe button or the little bell to be alerted when you start a show. Uh, maybe I need to get some of those graphics on and get it up. But all you guys are pretty much uh, regulars anyway. we got our regular group in here that's on a regular basis. So I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. So that was uh, NASDAQ. Again, where are we headed? It looks lower. If I break this up and look at it only an hourly time frame just to see what, what we might be coming into, you notice we have this line drawn at 17,217. Well, we bounce at it right now. You know, we literally bounce at it just right before the market close. Um, we'll see if that line holds. If that doesn't hold, then you're looking getting down right around 17,000 on the triple Qs, which would be great for me. Uh, you guys know I'm I don't usually buy directional. I like to I'd rather sell options. Uh, in this case, I actually did buy directional on the NASDAQ 100. I'm still holding those, so we'll see. Hopefully, that keeps on. Keeps on, keeping on. So that was down 1.97%, predominantly because of those big two. Now, if you look at the other factors, uh, let's real quickly take a peek at what is going to happen with those companies that are reporting on Thursday. Here is the big daddy, Apple. All right, Apple's had an aggressive sell-off. I mean, percentage-wise, Apple's just getting crushed over the past five trading sessions. From its peak to where it closed at today, it's down 6.1%. Remember, this is 9% of the indexes. Ouch. Um, where might we see it tomorrow? Well, it's at 184 right now. You could easily see it at 180 tomorrow. Um, I don't see that being any stretch of the imagination. Uh, certainly after the earnings announcement is when it really will... Um, have a chance to express itself and become a popcorn trade of the day. That one's going to be all over the place on Friday morning and particularly Thursday after hours. But there is your Apple, which down 1.94% today. Amazon, my favorite company, 2.39% slide, but looking better than all of them. This thing just, yeah, it looks like a small little pullback here. You wouldn't think that the market had a pretty big down day today just based off this tiny little pullback here. So no big deal here for Amazon. Uh, beginning of that demand zone for me starts about 151. So you're looking another $4 down, which would be about a roughly 2.4% slide in price tomorrow if it does to get to my uh, potential buy point on that pullback. So there's your Amazon. And then Meta, which not a fan of Meta. Don't care. Looks great. Ad revenue is probably going to be fantastic on this one. Um, looking at that one, you can see that pullback, same picture, but there isn't any real clear demand zone. The only thing I can see is down around 368, which who knows, you may hit that on the after hour session on Thursday night once they report earnings. Um, Mike Landon says, do you, know, um, do you know the best sector to buy since tech was overbought? Um, well, you know, I, I kind of shy away from those terms of overbought, oversold, simply because overbought just means it's moving up. Overbought means it's trending strong and overbought can lead to more overbought. Um, if you're looking to deploy your capital in maybe areas or market segments that were beaten down, there, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Let me go here to, um, to go stockchart.com. It's a kind of cool. There's a cool um, charting tool here you can use. One second. So let me go to SPY and I'll just go perf chart. So perf chart has a, a cool little feature here. Again, I don't pay for anything here. I just use the free stuff. Uh, you go here to predefined groups, and you can go into S&P sectors. So if you're looking for something that, you know, on the day or week or month, whatever it is, that um, you feel has been, you know, overbought or oversold and looking for, to allocate money to a different area, let's say you want to go back to last month. Let's go back 30 days. Um, tw 20 days is about a month if you go by trading sessions. You know, you can see the tech. Number one performer, almost everything else is negative. So if you're trying to bottom fish Michael and say which one is underperforming the most, uh, that's utilities. But that's been the case for some, some time. 
You also had materials and real estate uh, looking pretty beaten down. So I don't think personally that there is a direct um, target that if you go, oh, well, tech is overbought, therefore I should look at buying something else. I think you can always look at a, at a, at a scanner like this or just a table like this to see you know which ones have been undervalued. And then if that's the case, you could break apart. Let's say you wanted to buy something in, I don't know, the materials section. It's down 5.7% when the uh, technology is up 4%. Once you have that, you could simply go back, break apart the materials ETF, and see which ones are the strongest or weakest out of that specific market and buy those, depending on what your goals are. Uh, let's see if the daily, uh, daily W zone area on Apple holds tomorrow. Amazon will blow out earnings, in my opinion. I I agree with you, Big Ab. I think, I think Apple's going to beat. I think that Facebook is going to beat. And I think Apple, uh, sorry, I think Amazon will beat. I think Facebook will be, and I think Apple is, I think they're going to miss. I think they're going to miss earnings. You know, I, it's just, I have no real justification for it. So I, you're just talking, maybe it's because of my hatred for Apple. But, you know, you look back here, they seem bulletproof. They did miss their earnings, as I mentioned, one time back in February of 2023. Other than that, I mean, you have to scroll way back. I mean, you have to go years to find another area where they missed earnings it's all the way back in 2016. But remember, that's rolling out of iPhones and creating the, the iPhone addiction. You know, well, I don't know. I mean, the apps are doing well. Their cloud stuff is doing pretty well. Maybe watches and other services. But um, you're hearing their, their iPads are slowing down in sales. The Macs are going down. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. I will definitely be watching it. And you guys know I can't trade Apple. It was funny. Um, I was talking to Don Fran and said, hey, Let's do a wager. You know, you, you're a Chiefs fan, and I know your Chiefs are good, and I, I'm a big fan of the QB out there, Mahomes, but you're going to lose to my Niners. They go, let's make a bet. I said, let's make a bet. And he says, if I win, you have to make a trade on Apple. And I said, there's just some things I can't do. He's, it's like it's like making a bet with a vegan and saying, hey, if I win, you got to eat a whole ribeye steak. It's like, come on, that's against my principles, man. Respect my values. <laughs> um they can beat all they want. Will they? What will the price chart do exactly, Dave? Exactly. Um, you know, every single one of those can beat earnings. And you know, let's let's just show an example of that today. If you look at um, today's earnings, let's go back to. Oops, why is it not showing me today's earnings? Hold on. There we go. So let's look at some that had good earnings. Here is Qualcomm had pretty good earnings. They beat by fifteen percent on their earnings. They were down one percent. Um, what I love is when you see somebody that misses earnings and all of a sudden they're up like 30 or 40%. It's, it's crazy. Uh, these ones pretty much all did what they're supposed to do. The ones that beat earnings had nice little surges up, but you just never know, particularly with these tech stocks. So let me give you the, the rundown for tomorrow. By the way, here's your chart of Boeing. Boeing beat earnings today. You had Qualcomm, which beat earnings, MasterCard. So most of the big names beat earnings today, including Tava Pharmaceuticals. But here's what's happening for tomorrow. I've already mentioned this multiple times, and I, I never quite understood this. The way that Zacks works is they put up on their list like the most interesting ones, the ones that people are most interested in near the top. But you notice you got Apple. Yep, you got Amazon. Okay, but I'm going to sort by market cap. Now all of a sudden I get Meta in there. For some reason, Meta was just not at the top of the list, which it should be. They should just sort it by market cap. So Apple, Amazon, Meta, you got Merck, you have Shell reporting, Honeywell, uh, and that's kind of it for the big names. You have Altria in there and, and some fewer smaller ones down the list, uh, but that's a pretty significant day for anybody that's trading. And of course, if you look at the first official day of January, here is your economic calendar. Now, we do have for the UK, you have the Bank of England coming out with a rate announcement, and I mentioned this in my Monday Morning Must Knows. They're expected to stay the same 5.25%. No big deal there. However, keep your eye on this bank rate votes. Again, the bank rate votes is something that's very different than what we do. It's, at least it's much more transparent. There's nine voting members on the MPC council. So what you get is the first digit there, which as you can see is a two, all right? That is how many think that they should raise rates. The second number is lower rates, and the third one is keep rates exactly where they're at. So it looks like they're kind of softening over there with their voting members, uh, going from six people expecting to, uh, say, stay where we're at, to seven, and only two raising. For the U.S., unemployment claims, which is a normal one, but we do have a lot of manufacturing data. 
You can see 30 minutes into the trading day, ISM manufacturing PMI, ISM manufacturing prices. Uh, those are expected to stay pretty close to previous levels, but we'll see if there's any surprises there. Uh, you also have challenger job cuts for the U.S. and natural gas storage, which, uh, you know, I've heard the conversation with John Rowland yesterday, which I enjoyed. You know, that's that's a tough one. You look at uh, you look at what's gone on with natural gas and man, just you think to yourself it's going to bottom out here and it's a buying opportunity. But he brings up very valid points, and you know, looks like it may go lower before going higher. So if you're thinking about jumping on natural gas, you might want to hold off a little bit. Uh, the other piece there is for any of you that are trading oil, uh, you might want to be very careful because you have the OPEC meetings going on all day, um, and that also can create a bunch of waves on crude oil prices, which may have been part of the reason we saw it tank today. All right, I gave you guys an hour show yesterday. I'm at 41 minutes today. I'm going to wrap it up. I got things to do. So uh, again, if, let's see, is the metaverse hype over? Hmm, I think it might've been ahead of its time at that point. So I don't think that it's over. I think what you have was you had wave of excitement and you know its biggest spike and then it completely died away. What will probably happen is I think it's going to, I think it will come back. Right now you have Apple rolling out its, you know, its uh, mask thing. It looks like a ski mask, but to put you in an augmented world. I think that will start to push. Um, I think it's going to start to push the metaverse uh, topic back up. Now, who knows if that's going to be proprietary metaverse for Apple or if we start to see more devices. Because I have an Oculus, for example, but it's not that good. It's heavy. It gives me a headache because it weighs so much. But if you can get me something really light, I'd rather have a backpack on than just the, the visor. Um, I think that's going to start to create more interest in metaverse. I don't think it's going to be, you know, this phenomenal world that everybody's in. Um, the reality of it is you can be anything you want in the metaverse, but who cares? You have to power down and go back to your real life. So be everything you want to be in your real life, I think would be much better than trying to be in your um, in the virtual world. Uh, Jimmy, it's actually my girlfriend's dog. Yes, uh, recovering very well, remarkably well. Thank you for asking. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's adorable. I'll post a picture of him one day. He's, uh, you know, he's a great Dane, so he's just a giant dog. And he now, his, since the front of his bottom jaw is cut off, you know, they, cut out from, uh, they cut out both canines, and then on one side, they went two teeth behind the canine, so it's a diagonal cut. His tongue, like, hangs out all the time, so he just looks all derpy. <laughs> Super cute, but, uh, yeah, he's doing really well. Adding a trillion dollar trillion of debt in a quarter is not disinflationary. Yeah, David. And then that's scary. I mean, we, you would think we'd start to slow down on the amount of money we're adding to our debt, but it's actually accelerating. It's really scary. You know, I, I don't know. I think we all would agree that at some point the house of cards is going to come crashing down. But until it does, everything's going to keep on going up. Um, yeah, there's, there's no other way to explain it. You keep taking on that much debt. If any one of us took on that kind of debt at that accelerated level, we'd be bankrupt in a matter of days, if not weeks. In this case, the government can just keep on printing, which is why I'm a fan of crypto and digital assets. Oh, he had cancer. He had uh, a cancer right here on his front jaw. It's this huge mass that they had to remove. And yeah, he's, it was a week of just really uncomfortableness, but now he's uh, he, uh, surprisingly well, doing really good. Thank you guys for asking. <clears throat> Technically, if you trade SPXQQ or any index, you are trading Apple. Yep, it's like drinking. Yes, that's true, but I'm not trading. You can't avoid it, right? You can't avoid Apple in trading these markets. I'm just not going to trade it individually, specifically. So, yes. Tom, you thought you got me on that one. I know it's in all these ETFs. I mean, it's probably in some you know mutual funds. I have my 401k. Not worried about that. But I, I'm not going to trade it individually. <laughs> all right. So, I gave you your economic calendar. I gave you earnings calendar. That's pretty much it. Uh, Tom Mer Metaverse was a reboot of Second Life. It's 3500 bucks for GOGs. Yeah. It's not going to change things, Tom, but what will happen, and I think if you look out maybe two years, what you're going to start to get are a whole bunch of copycat goggle companies that are going to make something very similar to what Apple is making at a cheaper price point that allow you to access things like Decentraland or Sandbox or you know these different worlds with those devices, and that may start to spur interest in it again, but I don't think it'll be uh, this amazing world that, that they panned it out to be. It's fun, but I'd rather live a real life than live a virtual life. Cool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bill Addis will be our guest for tomorrow. If you have anything specific you want to talk about with Bill Addis, you know the routine. I'm going to talk about bonds. I'll see what his take is on yields. I want to know what his uh, thought is on what was done by the by the Fed. Of course, we all see that front end piece that they kept rates the same at five and a quarter percent. 
but there's other rate numbers that have been adjusted and I leave that to Bill to enlighten us all on because he's always digging through the minutia to find out what what was said, what was done, what its impact may be, uh, and of course answer any bond questions that you guys may have. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hit that like button if you enjoyed it. If you're new, hit subscribe. Let me know what topic you want to discuss anytime by emailing me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. That said, take everybody. I will see you tomorrow.